Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels 1892 English Edition Introduction When Europe emerged from the Middle Ages, the rising middle class of the towns constituted its revolutionary element. It had conquered a recognized position within medieval feudal organization, but this position also had become too narrow for its expansive power. The development of the middle class, the bourgeoisie, became incompatible with the maintenance of the feudal system. The feudal system, therefore, had to fall. But the great international center of feudalism was the Roman Catholic Church. It united the whole of feudalized Western Europe in spite of all internal wars into one grand political system, opposed as much to the schismatic Greeks as to the Mohammedan, Mohammedan countries. It had organized its own hierarchy at the feudal battle, and lastly, it was itself by far the most powerful feudal lord, holding, as it did, fully one-third of the soil of the Catholic world. Before profane feudalism could be successfully attacked in, every, in each country and in detail, this, its secret central organization, had to be destroyed. Moreover, parallel with the rise of the middle class, went on the great re revival of science, astronomy, mechanics, physics, anatomy, physiology were again cultivated, and the bourgeoisie for the development of its industrial production required a science which ascertained the physical properties of natural objects and the modes of action of the forces of nature. Now up to then, science had but been the humble handmaid of the church, had not been allowed to overlap the limits set by faith, and for that reason had been no science at all. Science rebelled against the church. The bourgeoisie could not do without success, and therefore had to join in the rebellion. The above, though touching, but two of the of the points where the rising middle class was bound to come into conclusion, collision with the established religion, will be sufficient to show first that the class most directly interested in the struggle against the pretensions of the Roman Catholic of the Roman Catholic Church was the bourgeoisie, and second that every struggle against feudalism at that time had to take on a religious disguise, had to be directed against the church in the first instance, but if the universities and the traders of the cities started to cry, it was sure to find and did find a strong echo in the masses of the country people, the peasants, who everywhere had to struggle for their very existence with the feudal with their feudal lords, spiritual and temporal. The long fight of the bourgeoisie against feudalism culminated in three great decisive battles. First was what is called the Protestant Reformation in Germany. The war cry raised against the church by Luther was responded to by two insurrections of a political nature. First, that of the lower nobility under Franz von Sickingen. Then the Great Peasants War, 1525 Anno Domini. Both were defeated, chiefly in consequence to the, of the indecision of the parties most interested, the burghers of the town, an indecision into the causes of which we cannot enter here. From that moment, the struggle degenerated into a fight between the local princes and the central power and ended by blotting out Germany for 200 years. From the politically active nations of Europe, 
the Lutheran Reformation produced a new creed indeed, a religion adapted to absolute monarchy. No sooner were the peasants of northeast Germany converted to Lutheranism than they were from free men reduced to serfs. But where Luther failed, Calvin won the day. Calvin's creed was one fit for the boldness of the bourgeoisie of his time. His predestination, predestination doctrine was the religious expression of the fact that in the commercial world of competition, success or failure does not depend upon a man's activity or cleverness, but upon circumstances uncontrollable by him. It is not of him that willeth, or of him that runneth, but of the mercy of unknown superior economic powers. And this was especially true at a period of economic revolution, when old economic routes and centers were replaced by new ones, when India and America were opened to the world, and when, when even the most sacred economic articles of faith, the value of gold and silver, began to tatter and to break down. Calvin's church constitution of God was republicanized. Could the kingdoms of this world remain subject to monarchs, bishops, and lords while the German, while German Lutheranism became a willing tool in the hands of princes? Calvinism founded a republic in Holland, and active republican parties in England and above all Scotland. In Calvinism, the second great bourgeois upheaval found its doctrine ready cut and dried. This upheaval took place in England. The middle class of the towns brought it on, and the yeomanry Yo of the country districts fought it out. Curiously enough, in all three great bourgeois risings, the peasantry furnishes the army that has to do the fighting, and the peasantry is the class that, the victory once gained, is most securely ruined by the economic consequences of that victory. A century after Cromwell, the yeomanry of England had almost disappeared. Anyhow, had it not been for the yeomanry and for the plebeian element in the town, the bourgeoisie alone would never have fought this matter out to the bitter end and would never have brought Charles I to the scaffold. In order to secure even those conquests of the bourgeoisie that were ripe for gathering at the time, the revolution had to be carried considerably further. Further, exactly as in 1793 in France and 1848 in Germany, this seems in fact to be one of the laws of evolution of bourgeois society. Well, upon this excess of revolutionary activity, there necessarily fell the inevitable reaction which, in its turn, went beyond the point where it might have maintained itself. After a series of oscillations, the new center of gravity was at, least, was at last attained and became a new starting point. The grand period of English history known to respectability under the name of the Great Rebellion and the struggle succeeding it, were brought to a close by the comparatively puny events entitled by the liberal historians the Glorious Revolution. The new starting point was a compromise between the rising middle class and the ex-feudal landowners. The latter, though cold as now, the aristocracy had been long since on the way which led them to become what Louis, Philippe, and France became at a much later period, the first bourgeois of the kingdom. Fortunately for England, the old feudal barons had killed one another during the War of the Roses. Their successors, though mostly scions of the old families, had been so much out of the direct line of descent that they constituted a quite a new body, with habits and tendencies far more bourgeois than feudal. They fully understood the value of money, and at once had to increase and at once began to increase their rents by turning hundreds of small farmers out and replacing them with sheep. Henry the Eighth 
while squandering the church lands, created fresh bourgeois landlords by wholesale. The innumerable confiscation of estates re-granted to absolute or relative upstarts and continued during the whole of the 17th century had the same result. Consequently, ever since Henry VII, the English aristocracy, far from counteracting the development of industrial production, had on the contrary sought to directly profit thereby. And there had always been a section of the great landlord owners willing, from economical or political reasons, to cooperate with the leading men of the financial and industrial bourgeoisie. The compromise of, 18, of 1689 was, therefore, easily accomplished. The political spoils of pelf and place were left to the great land-owning families, provided the economic interests of the financial, manufacturing, and commercial middle class were sufficiently attended to, and these economic interests were at that time powerful enough to determine the general policy of the nation. There might be squabbles about matters of details, but on the whole, the aristocratic, aristocratic oligarchy knew too well that its own economic prosperity was irretrievably bound up with that of industrial and commercial middle class. From that time, the bourgeoisie was a humble but still a recognized component of the ruling class of England. With the rest of them, it had a common interest in keeping in subjection the great working mass of the nation. The merchant or manufacturer himself stood in the position of master or, as it was until lately called, of natural superior to his, to his clerks, his workpeople, his domestic servants. His interest was to get as much as, and as good work out of them as he could. For this end, they had to be trained to proper submi submission. He was himself religious, his religion had supplied the standard under which he fought the king and the lords, and he was not long in discovering the opportunities this same religion offered him for working upon the minds of his natural inferiors, and making him submissive to the behests and the masters it had pleased God to place over them. In short, the English bourgeoisie now had to take part in keeping down the lower orders. The, the great producing mass in the nation, and one of the means employed for that purpose was the influence of religion. There was another factor that contributed to strengthen the, re the religious learned leanings of the bourgeoisie. That was the rise of materialism in England. This new doctrine not only shocked the pious feelings of the middle class, it announced itself as a philosophy only fit for scholars and cultivated men of the world. In contrast, the religion, which was good enough for the uneducated masses, including the bourgeoisie, with Hobbes, it stepped on the stage as a defender of royal prerogative and omnipotence. It called upon absolute monarchy to keep down the power robustus, and said, Manatasus. Robust but malicious boy, to wit the people. Similarly, with the successors of Hobbes, with Bolingbroke, Shaftesbury, etc., the new deistic form of materialism remained an aristocratic, esoteric doctrine, and therefore hateful to the middle class, both for its religious heresy and for its anti-bourgeois political connections. Accordingly, in opposition to the materialism and deism of the aristocracy, those Protestant sects which had furnished the flag in the fighting contingent against the Stuarts continued to furnish the main strength of the progressive middle class, and form even today the backbone of the great liberal party. In the meantime, materialism passed from England to France, where it met and coalesced with another materialistic school of philosophers, a branch of Cartesianism. In France, too, it remained 
At first, an exclusively aristocratic doctrine, but soon its revolutionary character asserted itself. The French materialists did not limit their criticism to matters of religious belief. They extended to it to whatever scientific tradition or political institution they met with. And to prove their claim of their doctrine to universal application, they took the shortest cut and boldly applied it to all subjects of knowledge in the giant work after which they were named the Encyclopedia. Thus, in one or of the other of its two forms, avowed materialism or deism, it became the creed of the whole culture, the youth of France, so much so that when the Great Revolution broke out, the doctrine hatched by English royalists gave a fear, theoretical flag to France French Republicans and terrorists, and furnished the text for the Declaration of the Rights of Man. The Great French Revolution was the third uprising of the bourgeoisie, but the first that had entirely cast off the religious cloak and was fought out and on undisguised political lines. It was the first two that was really fought out, fought out up to the destruction of one of the combatants, the aristocracy, and the complete triumph of the other, the bourgeoisie. In England, the continuity of pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary institutions, and the compromise between landlords and capitalists, found its expression in the continuity of judicial precedence and in the religious preservation of the feudal forms of law. In France, the revolution constituted a complete breach with the traditions of the past, it cleared out the very last vestiges of feudalism and created in the code Seville a masterly ad adaptation of the old Roman law, that almost perfect expression of the juridical relations corresponding to the economic stage called by Marx the production of commodities. To modern capitalist conditions, so masterly that this French Revolution code still serves as a model for reforms of the law of property in all other countries not except in England. Let us, however, not forget that if English law continues to express the economic relations of capitalist society and the barbarous feudal language, which corresponds to the thing expressed just as English spelling corresponds to English pronunciation, vos et severes londres, et vos pronounces constantemente said a Frenchman. That same English law is the only one which has preserved through ages and transmitted to America and the colonies. The best part of the old Germanic personal freedom, local self-government, and the independence from all interference, but that of law courts which on the continent has been lost during the period of absolute monarchy and has nowhere been as yet fully recovered. To return to our bo British bourgeoisie, the French Revolution gave him a splendid opportunity with the help of the continental monarchies to destroy French maritime commerce, to ex French colonies, and to crush the last French pretensions of to maritime rivalry. That was one reason why he fought it. Another was that the ways of the revolution went very much against his grain. Not only its accessible terrorism, but the very attempt to carry bourgeois rule to extremes. What should the British bourgeoisie do without his aristocracy? That taught him matters such as they were, and invented fashions for him. That furnished officers for the army, which kept order at home and the navy, which conquered colonial possessions and new markets abroad. Aboard. There was indeed a progressive minority of the bourgeoisie, that minority which whose interests were not so well attended to under the compromise. This section composed chiefly of the less wealthy middle class, did sympathize with the revolution, but it was powerless in parliament. 
Thus, if materialism became the creed of the French Revolution, the God-fearing English bourgeoisie held all the faster to his religion. Had not the reign of terror in Paris proved what was the upshot? If the religious instincts of the masses were lost, the more materialism spread from France to neighboring countries and was reinforced by similar doctrinal currents, notably by German philosophy, the more, in fact, materialism and free thought generally became on the continent the necessary qualifications of a cultivated man, the more stubbornly the English middle class stuck to its manifold religious creed. These creeds might differ from one another, but they were, all of them, distinctly religious Christian creeds.